One other thing is that there's a type, you know, there's a, there's a question. So those are all blood tests, first of all. But the other thing is, the question that a lot of doctors wonder about, and a lot of you guys probably too, is, is what good is it if they scan my brain? What if I get an MRI or a CAT scan? Do I need to get that? Well, there's still kind of controversy about that. It's, it turns out about only 1 to 2% of the time are you going to find something. Is, it, is, is there going to be something in the brain that could be causing the dementia that's, that's treatable or reversible? Okay? Um, one of those things that they can find is there's a, you've heard of water on the brain? It's called hydrocephalus. That's, a, that's a, where there's pressure. There's too much fluid in the brain, and the pressure is pushing. You obviously have a skull, right? So there's too much fluid in there, and there's no place for the fluid to go, and the brain, and the brain gets kind of squished between the skull and the, and, the, and the fluid, you know. And then that could damage the nerve cells or kill off some of the nerve cells. Well, think about it for a second. You can put a little tube in there, and you can drain that off into the belly. Some people have that. It's called a shunt. And you drain that off, and basically it lets the pressure off the brain, and then you basically, again, you stop the disease in its course. You, you, at that point, the, the nerve cells don't die off anymore. There are certain clinical symptoms. You don't necessarily have to scan somebody, everybody, you know, for that. There's, there's three main things you can see that, that can lead you to think that that's what's going on in a person. One is the dementia. They start to have the symptoms we talked about with dementia. Another one is they get incontinent, so they lose their bladder. Um, and, if, and then finally, the third one is they get an unsteady gait. They kind of stumble a little bit, and they're not real steady on their feet. So they have three things like that doesn't mean it's absolutely hydrocephalus or this, this, type of, this type of water on the brain, but it could be, and it's worth scanning the brain. If you scan the brain, then what you see is that the, some of the pockets where the fluid is are, are big. They're bigger than they should be, and they're squishing the brain. Um, again, it's fairly, I wouldn't say reversible maybe, but at least it's something that's treatable, it's something you can treat easier or better maybe than we can with Alzheimer's disease. Which brings me then to Alzheimer's disease. What do you do? If you have Alzheimer's disease, what can you do? Is there anything you can do? Does anybody know? Has anybody heard of any treatments for Alzheimer's disease? Nobody? You have? Well, they tell you to stay active mentally. Absolutely. That's one thing is use it or lose it. Okay? That's one thing I say. Now that doesn't prevent you from getting Alzheimer's, but I tell you, they've studied and they found that people who uh, have used their brain a lot over the years, it, what we think happens is that you don't see the, the dementia as early because they have so much extra reserve. They can lose several nerve, nerve cells, I don't know, several hundred maybe or something like that, before you see any, any evidence of the, of the damage. It's probably more than 100 or so. I'm not just making that up. But, but uh, you know, the more reserve you have in your brain, meaning the, type, the more tightly it is connected, you know, and basically every time you learn something new, you're making new connections in the brain. So, you know, learn stuff. Use your brain. I tell folks that have Alzheimer's disease, don't give up doing stuff you can still do. Don't be sitting there saying, I got Alzheimer's, I'm just giving up. That's not, it's over for me. It lasts 10 to 12, 20 years, the average course, 10 to 20 years. That's a long time. I mean, some people live 20 years with it. So, you know, get as good a quality of life as you can for as long as you can. So staying active, keeping your brain active is one thing. Um, the, let's go ahead and talk about stuff that's non-medication related first, okay? That's one thing. Exercise is another thing. Exercise has been shown to actually help you lay down new nerve cells and uh, protect the nerve cells that you have. We talked about that, I think, when we talked about stress or depression or something. I think we talked about how the uh, exercise protects you against the damage that cortisol can, can cause. And cortisol is the, the chemical that, you know, when you're stressed, gets released and can damage nerve cells. So you don't want to damage your nerve cells anymore. I mean, if you're having something that's killing them off, let's protect everyone that we can. And exercise is a good way to do that. Incidentally, all the same stuff you do to protect your heart is very good for your brain. It makes sense, right? I mean, you got little blood vessels around your heart that supply your heart with heart muscle with blood. You got little blood vessels in your brain that supply your brain with blood, right? So if you have something that's clogging up your vessels around your heart, it's probably clogging up the vessels around your brain too, okay? If you can prevent that, watching what you eat, watching your cholesterol level, if you have, if you have to take cholesterol medicines, incidentally now we're studying, we are studying medicines like Lipitor and Zocor and things like that that, that lower cholesterol. We're studying that to see if we can't prevent Alzheimer's disease or in some cases of Alzheimer's disease in fact. Um, it, it's, it's iffy at this point as to whether that works. There, it looks like there are some people it helps and some people it doesn't and we can't really figure out why that is. Um, but that's one thing, watching your cholesterol, watching blood pressure, make sure your blood pressure is under control. Um, 
and exercise we talked about. So all the things that are good for your heart are good for your brain. So those things are good to do. Um, any, anything else that's, that's stress, for instance, or depression, or things like that, that can also affect your brain, you, you want to treat all those things. Um, when it comes to uh, medications, um, basically, they, they, there's only at this point there are two things available that are approved, you know, by the FDA to be used. Okay, and I, I told you you didn't have enough of this chemical, right? So some some of you folks are out here thinking, all I got to do is increase that chemical. How's that going to happen? You know, and you're smart because that's exactly what one of the medicines, one of the group or classes of medicines do. Okay, this chemical. It gets released by one nerve cell, picked up by the other nerve cell, and it sends the message, whether it's a memory or whatever it is, okay? And it sends the message. And then what happens is this thing gets released from that other nerve cell, floats around for a little while, and gets chewed up by a little Pac-Man guy, okay? Well, this little Pac-Man guy, if you can block him, if you can put a muzzle on him so he can't eat, you know, then this little chemical gets to float around a little bit longer, right? Which means it can get used again, and the message gets through again, right? So you're, you, you, there's a class of medicines like Aricept. Have anybody ever heard of Aricept? Uh, Denepazil is the generic name, and then Exelon is another one. Uh, there's another one too. It's it's by uh, it's Janssen and Janssen, but I, it changed its name somewhere along the line, so I can't remember. It used to be called Remedil. But these three medicines basically block that Pac-Man guy. So they basically allow this chemical to stay around longer, so you get more efficient use of this chemical. Okay. Well. It's good, but it's not good enough, is it? Because you're losing the nerves that make this. So eventually, you lose enough of the nerves that make it, and you're still going to be low. And I don't care how efficient you are using it, you just don't have enough to get the job done, right? So how do we do, what, do we, what can we do, I guess, to protect the nerve cell, to keep the nerve cells from dying off? If we can do that, I mean, that's a pretty good treatment, right? There's one medicine now that's available uh, called Nomenda. I don't know if anybody's heard of Nomenda. No? Memantine is the generic name for that. And uh, Nemenda is actually a medicine that they think is, 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 can be protective of some of the nerve cells. And they did a study where they looked at Aricept plus Nemenda. So you made, the, you made the nerve cells more efficient, but then also protected them. And that, that seems to work a little better than either one alone. What do they do, though? I mean, what do you see when you give somebody these things? Do they get dramatically better? They come way back up in their memory? Not usually. That's the tricky part. And that's, that's why there's a lot of controversy about are these things worth it and all that. And I'll tell you, I think they're worth it. I mean, if I had Alzheimer's disease, I'd want them, both of them. And the reason is because it slows the progression of the illness. And you're going to ask me, how do you know that, Doc? And that's a good question. I mean, how do you know? How would you know if you didn't treat somebody, how quickly they would drop with their Alzheimer's? You know, would, they, would they drop you know, in five years? Would they get severe, go from mild to severe in five years? Well, we have some averages. Um, we do a little test, uh, at least some of the folks do, a little, the doctors do a little test called a uh, mental status exam. It's a 30 point test, and they did some studies where they looked at how, what's the average person, if you don't treat them, they have Alzheimer's disease and you don't treat them, out of those 30 questions or 30 points, how quick do they drop every year? And the average is three to five points a year, okay? So somebody comes into you and they have a 24 or 25 on this test, and you think that with the history and everything else, the blood tests and all that, you make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, you can pretty much say to them, I think you're going to, on average, you're going to have a chance, you're going to drop three to five points a year on this test. And they're going to say, well, what does that mean? Well, that means that, that you're, drop, you're losing nerve cells, which then means you're going to lose function, okay? You, in other words, function meaning, you know, day-to-day -day activities taking care of yourself, bathing yourself, things like that. As time goes on and you lose nerve cells with Alzheimer's disease, you basically you kind of regress just about like you do when you progress when you're a baby. So you go from being totally independent to being totally dependent. And at some point you become bedridden and you know you, can, you can't speak, you can't feed yourself or any of that, right? That's what happens with Alzheimer's disease eventually, okay? If, um, if we can push that whole process back, and we can delay that process by a year or two with the medicines, well, that's something to me. I think that's worth it. Um, everybody can have, you know, have your own opinions, I suppose. But if somebody doesn't go into a nursing home as quickly, or if uh, there's less burden on the caregiver, the caregiver, by the way, you know, it's, I don't know if anybody has, knows anybody with Alzheimer's or takes care of anybody with Alzheimer's disease, it's extremely difficult. It's not easy to do. It wears on you 24-7. 
you've got to be awake, alert, you know, going, knowing where this person is all the time so they don't wander out in the street. It's a difficult, difficult thing 